you just said too about the difference between cine lenses for film and cine lenses for digital. Funny thing is like, I, I think even like manufacturers in the, let's call it around 2016 to 2018, we're starting to catch wind of this trend of like um, older lenses being adopted. And uh, I sat down with like Zeiss engineers and they're scratching their head. Like, what, what do you like about this lens? This is terrible. And it's like, the problem is, is that it, it becomes almost too clinical. It's almost a, something that I feel when I'm doing like cinematography. If like, if the if the if the if the look is not imbuing something to the scene, it just feels like it's a, a 100% pure crystalline recreation of what I'm seeing in my eye. It feels like it's lacking something. I need to somehow make it more cinematic. And maybe that maybe that's atmosphere in the set, or maybe it's how the lens is reacting to the light and, and creating a veiling glare that puts a la layer to. Uh, taking the, the reality out of the situation. I don't want my cinematography to feel like I'm just looking at reality or it's like like a, a very pure rendition of a documentary or something. I want it to, to, to create a world, to create a mood, uh, an emotional thing. And the lens can have a, a chief influence in that. So um, when the manufacturers started to realize this, they, they, it was a struggle for a lot of them to say, like, we're going to design an imperfect lens. Like, we're going to keep the aberration in that we've been working so hard for all these decades to figure out how to engineer out. And they got there. Like the last sort of series of cinema lenses were so well in, um, corrected for all the sort of the limitations, uh, uh, both optically and mechanically, like the, the actual mechanics have become very reliable, very um, robust, able to work in the field. Uh, and at the same time, you put that on a digital camera, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. And then you put on, uh, you know, some $50 uh, still lens, and then you hear a gasp from the video village. Like, oh, oh, you get you know the, you get light spreading across the frame, and you know I I say like, you know, a, a veiling glare or or a, a soft or diffused flare could feel like a memory. It could feel like nostalgia in the image, and it it I don't know why that is. Why it strikes this chord? What ha what happens in terms of like the visual like lexicon of humanity? When you feel a flare, it feels nostalgic to you. Uh, and I'm it, it's not like cinema is like rife with like lens flares from the 20s and 30s or something that would create this sort of um this visual memory in us but for some reason it's there and it it, it, it creates this this emotional response into us that it, it is there it's it's palpable i think that that's part of the evolution of this whole book for us uh when when chris and i started to get into teaching about optics uh we went through um, a series of tests uh, at Panavision and at Camtech, where we tested every 50 millimeter lens that they had in house. And it, somewhat it, as a confessional, in, in my career as a cinematographer prior to that, because I was mostly a Panavision guy, my lens knowledge was super speeds, ultra speeds, and, and primos. And we did this test and laid them out as a still frame from each of the examples. And Chris likes to call it the Denny's menu, it's sort of this picture of all of these options. And it melted our brains to see the different characters and what these different glass brought. And it became the idea of creatively casting a lens for a storytelling aspect. And that was a big part of what I wanted to teach. Why? Why are these lenses different? Why do we have a different emotional reaction to them? And to understand when I look at a Series 2 Pancro compared to a Panavision Primo. Why is it so different and why is my response to it so different? I wanted to understand that and to be able to share that so that cinematographers understand how to ask for what they want. Yeah, given the definition of what they're actually looking at and how to speak in those terms, both as what a lens technician or an optical designer would understand um, and be able to ask because you mentioned the, the, the term detuning, for example, like taking these pristine well-corrected, engineered uh, designs and de-optimizing them, introducing aberrations that were already taken out. And that's largely affected by either traditionally taking coatings off or even recoding with a, a less robust coating and also changing air spacings so that they're not actually in the, the proper place where they would to correct an aberration. So they're allowing a little bit of spherical aberration to be introduced into the lens. And that does a lot to affect the performance of the lens and, and in also imbue these sort of properties because you can emulate the look of, of an old Cook Speed Pancro with a little bit of a introduction of a aberration with a, even a, a modern lens. And this is what uh, a company like Panavision does quite a bit to um, create more C-series uh, 
anamorphics, for example, they don't have, they're not just going out and buying some used cook speed pancro and putting it in front of some different cylinders that they have. They're also just taking modern optics they have and tuning them to match the look and feel of that. Uh, but I think there's been an acknowledgement that there's value in aberrations. There's a value in um, sort of the bespoke uh, properties that you can get off the lens on the image. It's not like a post-production artifact. It, it's certainly an electronic effect that you're putting onto it. It's also not a filter you're putting in front of the lens to try to to add a gauziness or 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 a, a streak or or or, or a, a defocusing of the image. It's actually organic into the uh, the the path of light going through hunks of glass. Yeah. So that um, for me that feels almost more pure. I use the word organic to the lens. It's it's part of actually the image formation. And that happens at different parts of the optical path, different parts of where the image is actually an aerial image flying through the optics and has different um, focal um, aspects to it. So it's not, the aerial image cannot be focused at that point where it's getting um, tweaked by a detuned lens, a, an incorrectly spaced uh, element. And then how that forms and, and is created at the image plane is suddenly altered in an interesting way. And you can put that on a, a very, um, high rendition, high resolution sensor and see those properties recreated very faithfully. So you're not introducing this artifact or this degradation at the by these different development processes. You're seeing the qualities of that lens really created. And there's been a debate about like resolution. I'm on the on the camp of the more the merrier and um, I like having data and, and having my digital negative, if it were, having as much robust data, both in terms of bit depth, but in terms of also sampling, I feel like that's great. If I have that information, I can work with it. I can always degrade that later. And other people saying, oh, that's all just marketing hooey. We don't need more Ks. We need, we need better pixels. We don't need more pixels. The truth of the matter is you need both. You need a well-designed um, color pipeline and development. And resolution is part of sampling. And that's important as well. So when you see an old 80-year-old Pancro or a Baltar on uh, an Alexa 65, there's not, there's a reason why the films that come out that are shot on Alexa 65 are among the best looking films. It's, it's not because resolution doesn't matter, it's because it's also a component. And the depth of field of the larger format plays into it, but you're also nuancing all those characteristics of that lens, that imperfect vintage lens. And so I think it's a great marrying of, of both ideas. So you have like the technology trying to harness what you're creating and you're putting on literally something that was a paperweight on some cinematographer's desk for 30 years that suddenly now is worth, you know, your house, yeah. you know, and for good reason. Yeah.